attention humanitarian and development professionals. Are you looking to take your career to the next level? Then you've come to the right place. Humanitarian Global offers self-paced online courses designed specifically for you. With our comprehensive curriculum, you'll build your capacity in the most critical areas of humanitarian and development work. Our course offerings include monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning, water, sanitation and hygiene, disaster risk reduction and management, food security and nutrition in emergencies, procurement and supply chain management, human nutrition and dietetics, maternal, infant and young child nutrition. With Humanitarian Global, you'll have the opportunity to grow your skills and impact the lives of people in need. Visit our website to learn more about our courses and apply today. Hey everyone, uh, I believe all of you can hear me and can see me too. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar. We truly appreciate uh, that you've taken the time. Uh, thank you, Isaac, to just join the session and getting to learn more. Today, we will be looking at uh, writing a wedding proposal, looking precisely on donor research and prioritization. And we truly appreciate that you've taken the time. Uh, my name is Sheila. Um, um, what, what can I say? Yes, I'm the Academic Registrar at Humanitarian Global. So if you join HG, you'll find, uh, you'll find us there just trying to make sure that whatever you really want to study, uh, you'll be able to gain from us. So thank you for joining. What we will do is, first of all, we will start with introductions. I'm seeing a lot of us are, are complaining about sound. I believe all of you can hear me. So we'll start with introductions and then just a brief of uh, the course that we do. And then finally, we get to do the training for the day. So welcome. I'm seeing a lot of people who are introducing themselves. So I'll just do a short shout out to most of you. Jack, Jock John, Karibu Sana, I'm seeing uh, who else, who else is joining? Hello, hello Amid, hello Abdirahman, hello Bilan, hello Innocent, hello Barak, hello Mohammed. all of you, thank you so much. If you put your name, I'll definitely do a shout out to you um, as well. So with that, allow me to introduce uh, my colleagues who have been able to make this uh, webinar a success. Yes, Shilekwe, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Winnie. Wow, that is nice. Thank you, Adebe Evans. Welcome. Dio, thank you. Thank you, Nega. All of you. Thank you so much. I'll be doing these shout outs once in a while. Thank you, Ruth. So, with that, allow me to introduce my colleagues. I think I'll start with uh, Brian. Brian, kindly unmute and say hi to the, to the participants. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, as Sheila said, my name is Brian, um, part of the technical team that ensures uh, that the webinar is a success. So thanks for joining us, and uh, we look forward to a resourceful event. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. And I can also see I have a Grace. Hi, Grace. Hi, Moreka. I also have a Sheila from Horn of Africa. Brian is being greeted by Ahmed, and then Hamo Maruga, and finally Akin Wumi. Welcome. Let's have Anthony. Anthony, kindly introduce yourself. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much, Sheila, and uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so happy to be part of this meeting and uh, looking forward to a great interaction. Uh, my name is Anthony from the academic support team, uh, making sure that I can support Sheila, my colleague, uh, Brian, to ensure that uh, we can all have a great time. So as we look forward to uh, starting the webinar, uh, please uh, do share your uh, the, the link uh, with your colleagues and also your friends. And uh, we look forward to a very uh, resourceful event. So thank you so much. And uh, back to you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for that. And then finally, I'm seeing Pacific. Welcome. Thank you, Lydia Esther. Thank you, Yamane. Thank you, Shadrach. Thank you, Friday. Thank you, Hassan. Great, uh, and thank you, Nora, and thank you, Emeka. Yes, we are definitely going to share the resources uh, after the session, so please stay tuned and just have your pen and paper ready as we work on getting what's the, the learning for the day. Allow me to also introduce Linda, uh, who's uh, our trainer for the day. She'll just say hi, and then later on, she, she has prepared for us. Welcome, Linda. Hi everyone, thank you Sheila and thank you for everyone who's joined for the webinar today. Um, my name is Linda Obura. I am a project management 
expert with 13 years of experience in project management and public health. Uh, looking forward to be able to share um, something about winning proposals and uh, donor mapping, donor prioritization and research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. And we can't wait to see what you have in store for us. With that, uh, allow me to to bring on board my colleague to tell us a bit about the courses that we have and the proposal, then we can proceed from there. Welcome, Andy. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Sheila, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of our participants uh, from uh, wherever you might be joining us from. Uh, so I do believe that uh, most of us have been able to engage uh, with our website, uh, with our social media platforms, uh, be it on Facebook, uh, be it on Instagram and other uh, avenues when it comes to uh, the digital space. Uh, so as we look forward to the today's uh, uh, topic, I would like to share with you some training that uh, we do offer when it comes to uh, resource mobilization and um, uh, management. Uh, this is uh, looking at uh, your organization. Uh, maybe this is a grassroots organization. You're doing uh, so much of um, uh, project on the uh, uh, the uh, the grassroots uh, level and also trying to make sure that you can also mobilize resources uh, for you to be able to uh, to attain that. So with that said, um, uh, we do have our website here and um, uh, this is a link that my colleague is going to be sharing with you on the chat section and I'm just trying to uh, make sure that I can take the shortest time possible here. Uh, so uh, once you go to the website, uh, we do have uh, this link for uh, learning and services. Uh, you're going to find uh, that uh, we do also have the link to the training calendar, and that is where you can see all the upcoming trainings that uh, we're going to be having. Uh, you can also go for the workshops as well, and uh, you're going to have a list there. So the key point of interest as of today is looking on uh, resource mobilization and uh, management. And um, in this uh, category, uh, we do offer so many training here. And uh, one of them that I would want us to have in mind is uh, donor mapping and uh, proposal writing. So today, as we look at uh, uh, donor research and the prioritization, uh, I would like us to also have a look at uh, what we do cover, because this is a one-hour webinar. We might not be able to cover so much in terms of uh, getting in-depth, but uh, with this uh, kind of a training, uh, you're going to be able to uh, go through all these areas. And uh, this is a two-week uh, program uh, whereby we look at uh, introduction to donor mapping. So before you even now go uh, forward and write um, uh, that proposal and uh, think about the uh, winning proposal, you need to have done your donor mapping right. So that is uh, what we cover here. And uh, within this uh, training, maybe just to run you through, we have introduction to donor mapping. Uh, we also look at, uh, 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 we look into now the overview of fundraising and donor engagement. Uh, we look at import importance of uh, donor mapping in project uh, development. Uh, we also look at the types of donors and their characteristics. In the second module, it's about the tools and techniques uh, when it comes to donor mapping. Uh, we look at the research methods for identification of uh, potential donors. Uh, we look at the utilization of technology when it comes to donor mapping. And uh, also um, uh, looking at the data analysis and uh, targeting for donors. And then uh, we do also have a third module here looking at uh, the proposal writing fundamentals. So after we have, uh, we have done our donor mapping, we now get into how do we write now the proposal. So we look at the fundamentals uh, starting with the structure and, and uh, also the component when it comes to writing a proposal. Uh, we do also look at, um, uh, you know, the donor requirements and also the guidelines uh, because uh, these organizations, the donors, they come with uh, different uh, requirements and uh, uh, also guidelines as you try to approach them and also how to set clear uh, and also measurable objectives when it comes to the proposals that you're working on. Uh, now go, uh, getting in depth uh, when it comes to crafting a persuasive uh, proposal, uh, we look at how to write a compelling uh, project description. Uh, we look at uh, developing realistic budgets and also financial plans together with the uh, incorporation of impact assessment and uh, sustainability in proposals. Uh, we do also now uh, look into uh, how to tailor the proposal to different donors. So as I did mention, different donors, they come with different requirements, uh, different specifications. So now we take you through on how you can hone your skills when it comes to uh, how to tailor make the, uh, those uh, proposals so that they can appeal to the donor that you want to approach. So we look at uh, adapting proposals for institutional donors. Uh, we also take you through uh, what we call the customization of proposals for corporate donors and also approaching individual donors and uh, strategies and the tips that you need to apply. 
And then lastly, it's about communication and uh, relationship building uh, with donors. And uh, here we look at the effective communication strategies in fundraising, uh, how to build and uh, maintain a positive relationship. So we talk about donor retention, it's very key and also addressing uh, donor concerns and also feedback. So this is a two weeks uh, program. And uh, for this uh, two weeks program, uh, we do have um, uh, the, uh, the outline as I have taken you through and uh, for you to register for this course, uh, we're going to be sharing with you the link on the description on the chat section, sorry. And then uh, you can see the applicable dates for the on-site one, you can come over to Nairobi, uh, you can uh, let us know what is um, uh, the inquiry as by your, or uh, maybe the needs as by your team, and then you can be able to custom make this uh, program for you. And also you can do the program uh, online. And uh, this is going to take a period of two weeks and uh, you can see the applicable fee. So lastly, uh, before I can bring on Linda, as I try to rush against the time now here, uh, we do have uh, uh, how to write the winning proposals uh, as a standalone course. And uh, this is a one week uh, program. And uh, here maybe just to run you through, it's all about how to draft now the winning proposals. Uh, we look at the introduction and uh, we start by looking at the donor requirements again. Uh, we have the different formats when it comes to uh, you know, uh, uh, writing the proposals, we look at the gu guidelines and also the formats. We talk about project uh, development and, and the proposal writing, uh, concept notes, uh, and also the pitch deck and also the components of a funding proposal. And then uh, secondly, now we look into how to write it and uh, we start at uh, looking at uh, the different components of a proposal. Uh, that is a, the introduction, we have the problem statement, uh, we have the uh, project uh, justification, uh, that is the rationale, uh, project design, implementation strategies, project monitoring and evaluation. Uh, we have risk management, project management, cross-cutting issues in proposal writing, work plan, organization uh, capacity, and also the budgeting aspect, uh, which is very key. And then lastly, now we try to benchmark with some of the best uh, uh, case studies when it comes to uh, the writing, the best uh, writing uh, uh, practices when it comes to proposals. So we take you through the common mistakes uh, made during proposals and how can you avoid them and also the tips uh, for successful proposal writing together with uh, you know some of the success uh, successful case studies that uh, we can try to talk from so as we look into that i know linda she's going to be delving more into some of these components uh, this is a one uh, week course and uh, we look forward to having you on board uh, you're going to find all the registration details there and uh, the good thing is that uh, we do have this course uh, uh, these are uh, course uh, the next class uh, starting next week, uh, that is uh, from Monday all the way to Friday. And uh, the timing for the class is uh, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. East African time. It is a two hour class, uh, and that is a via live Zoom class, and uh, the cost is uh, 300 USD there. So if, uh, if you're interested for you to join this class, uh, please uh, drop us a message on the chat, and uh, we are going to get back to you. So with that said, uh, we do look forward to having you on board, and uh, thank you once again. Uh, feel free to interact with our team, ask us questions, and uh, we're going to guide you through. So thank you so much, and uh, back to you, Sheila, and uh, sorry for taking too much of your time. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Anthony, for that. I believe you've already done a lesson, and you've made uh, Linda's work very much easy. Uh, I think uh, there's, there's a comment that I've read, uh, hiring dude. For your hand, will you send the document? Yes, we will be sharing these uh, recordings and uh, presentation by close of business tomorrow. So stay tuned for that even as we continue. Please, again, use the chat feature uh, uh, to just share in your thoughts and your ideas and use the Q&A section to have, if you have any questions that you would want us to answer, uh, especially the trainer in regards to what she has in store for us. Welcome, Adeshina. Welcome, Otim, Otim Jasper. So with that, allow me to bring on board Linda to take over the session. Welcome, Linda. Thank you so much, Sheila. I hope you can all hear me. So for today's session, we are going to delve just or give an overview of what and how writing winning proposals work. Uh, just as Anthony has said, the, the courses that we do uh, at Humanitarian Global actually handle the specific uh, nitty gritty details for the, for the topics that we are talking about. And for the webinar today, we'll just be going through an overview of how we write winning proposals, how we do our donor mapping, and why it is important to do your research properly and do your prioritization properly when you're doing your donor mapping. 
And actually donor mapping is just identifying who is the donor that um, you as an organization have, an, have a con convergence with in terms of your priorities when you're writing proposals. Without um, taking too much of your time, uh, I will go into the presentation. I hope everyone can see it. Okay, so we'll do the basics uh, of just understanding why we write proposals and what proposals are. We do write proposals as written pitches uh, seeking to address specific issues. And those issues can be a problem that we have identified as an organization and we have come up with a solution or we are proposing a solution on how we want to solve the problem, what we hope to accomplish and achieve. And in this case, presenting your case and a solution, which is the what, the why, the which, the where, the when, and the how. So when you're writing your proposal, you need to ensure that you have answered all those questions that I have mentioned there. And we do proposals for resource mobilization specifically, where we say that resources can be funding uh, in terms of money or resources can be infrastructure. They can be donation elements to um, seeking to address a specific issue. For example, if we're doing a project for uh, young girls in school or teenage adolescent girls and young women in school, then in that case, we are looking for uh, like a donation for sanitary towels for them. So then there we are resource mobilizing. We are looking for resources to be able to buy the sanitary towels for the girls in school. So it is important to note that resource mobilization is not 100% about the cash. It can be resources in various other forms, in kind or in supplies or in infrastructure. For example, if you're building a school, and we would like to build the classrooms, then we are doing resource mobilization for that. So proposals are basically written pitches to be able to propose a solution to a problem that we have identified. Normally proposals can be, if we are requesting for funding, they can be solicited or unsolicited. Um, solicited in terms of uh, the development partner or the donor has requested for proposals. They have sent out a request for proposal, in which case they have already identified what the problem is and they would like a solution. And you as the organization can be having priorities or have been implementing solutions to such kind of problems. And so you see yourself as a good fit to be able to submit a proposal um, for the request for proposal from the donor or the development partner. So that is a solicited proposal because it has a request for proposal. When we come to the unsolicited proposals, those are proposals that uh, we as the organization have actually noticed or identified a problem and we are proposing a solution to the problem and are now writing a proposal to a specific development partner to be able to either fund us or mobilize for resources. When we look at win, uh, how we write uh, winning proposals and how we need to prepare to be able to write winning proposals, we will just look a little bit into what is the roadmap that we should be using for writing those proposals before we even look at the request for proposals or before we submit a proposal for uh, review for funding. So how do we position ourselves as, as the organization? Are we able to have some intelligence, have some due diligence done before we write the proposal just to know which are the organizations that we can submit to? Who are the development partners that we can submit to? Who are the donors that we can submit to? Is it possible to be able to meet these organizations before? Can we cultivate a relationship with these organizations? How can we identify potential specialists to help us to write the proposals? Or in our teams, do we have um, potential specialists who can be able to craft our proposals in ways that can be um, award-winning? How can we be able to share our success stories which are coming from uh, various, or if we have implemented projects of that kind before, how can we share our success stories and how can we um, document our 
success stories to be able to share with potential donors even before the request for proposal. While we're doing our due diligence, are we able to know that a specific development partner is going to be sending out a request for proposals early enough so that we can start preparing? Those are some of the things we need to do. When you are um, doing your due diligence, how do you understand what your client or the development partner requires before you write the proposal? So what is it that um, your development partner or donor requires for you to be able to develop a winning proposal. You need to find out what are the requests for proposal uh, requirements. How do you stick to uh, complying with the request for proposal requirements? How do you ensure that you uh, prepare all the documents that you need? Sometimes we may be a new organization and we have not implemented before. So do you have the requisite registration documents for your organization? Do you have tax exemption if you're a non-governmental organization? Do you understand the context in which you want to implement it? What are the cultural, political issues? Um, what are some of the risks that you may get into in your uh, implementation jurisdiction? You need to understand those things. What are some of the catch words that are used uh, within the document that you are going to send to your potential uh, client? And client in this case, I mean the donor or the development partner. What, what, what are some of the technical uh, issues or technical scope of work when you're prescribing your, doc, your solution? What are some of the technical things that you need to ensure that you have indicated or submitted within the documentation? Is it success stories? Is it um, audited? as financial statements for your organization for previous projects? Is it your HR uh, plan? Is it your partnerships and stakeholders um, for previous projects? Do you have baseline studies or baseline surveys that you have done that you need to share? You need to demonstrate experience. And by demonstrating experience, you need to have the correct uh, specialists or the correct um, team to be able to demonstrate the kind of experience that you that you have. If it is a proposal for a consultancy, do you have the correct um, resumes for your specialists within your team, for your experts within your team? So these are some of the things that you need to consider when you're working towards writing uh, winning proposals. When you come to submitting your proposals, ensure that you're precise, concise, Make sure you review, ensure you're consistent, ensure you have stuck to the requirements that are outlined for the request for proposals, ensure that your documents um, follow the terms and conditions that have been set out for the request for proposals, ensure that you have included all the documents that you needed to include in your, in your, in your submission. If it is a presentation that you have been asked to do, kindly prepare very well for your presentation. Ensure that with the relationships that you have developed, you're able to negotiate with um, the person receiving the document about when you will do your presentations. If you need to invite your donors for activities that you are doing so that they can have an overview of what your organization does, uh, ensure that you're able to speak or to have a relationship with your um, development partner. So then that increases your chances of actually uh, winning or being awarded uh, some funding for the proposals. So basically after considering all those points that we're talking about, we need to understand how we are then going to write our proposals. And for writing winning proposals, you need to be able to give a particular timeline or give yourself time to be able to do your background research properly, be able to do your due diligence properly, and give yourself time for doing the project uh, description. The project description is where you answer all the questions I was talking about, the what, the where, the when, the how, and the which. There is where you do your scope of work. What is it that 
uh, you're going to be doing, what are your goals and objectives, what is your problem statement, what are the statistical um, data uh, sources that you have used, what are the statistical data that you're using to back up your solution to the problem, and also just to share why um, you think whatever the problem is or the problem you have identified is an issue in your jurisdiction. You need to have enough time to be able to prepare to write a winning proposal. So I'll also delve a little bit into uh, writing the winning proposal, just give an overview of what we need to include where, how we need to do it. And then we go into now looking at uh, the actual donor mapping. So for the writing proposal outline, we will look at the proposal life cycle, uh, the call for proposals or the request for proposals, we use that interchangeably. Um, the proposal development team as an organization, how do you put your team together? Then the actual writing of the proposal and uh, finally the donor mapping. Kindly, if you have any question, feel free to put them in the Q&A or in the chat, Sheila, you will help me with that. So when it comes to the proposal life cycle, uh, normally we identify the opportunity, you do an initial assessment of, um, or feasibility study of what the problem is and what solution you're trying to um, propose for that same problem. So what is the opportunity that you have identified? Where is the gap? What is the problem? All those words can be used interchangeably when you're trying to come up with a proposal. And it also depends on which sector we are talking about. When it comes to bidding, um, normally we look at your submissions. If we are talking about, for example, um, tenders or requests for proposals that uh, have a tender-like um, winning and bidding model, depending on the development partner, then you also need to look at the assessment rating. What are the uh, development partners looking at in terms of the rating? Normally they give the requirements and they send you the requirements. Do you as an individual, as an individual organization have the capacity to be able to win that bid? Um, what are the risk assessments? You need to do your risk, uh, risk analysis and check what are the risks to this proposal or rather what are the risks to your implementation or does your solution have or come with some risks? Some risks can be political, depending on where you're implementing. Some risks can be financial, they could be strategic. So you need to do your risk analysis before you actually submit your proposal because then those are important and they will help you as an organization to actually understand if you have capacity to be able to implement where you're trying to implement or not then you need to then prepare your proposal and preparing your proposal, we will see how we prepare our proposal, have your teams in place, review your proposal, check the quality, what are, who are your stakeholders, who do you plan to work with, all those need to be included in your proposal. And then the submission, which we have already talked about, ensure you stick to the requirements that have been uh, given by them development partner if it is a solicited uh, request for proposals or if it is unsolicited you need to be able to internally have your own specific requirements to be able to send out to the uh, development partner. Additionally you need to understand your development partner or your donor to be able to know what they usually re require in terms of um, submitting proposals. Finally, you look at the contracts, if any, do you need to sign up any contracts to be able to um, show the donor what you're doing or after your proposal has been submitted and you've been awarded, then you start um, developing the contracts. Once you have developed the contracts, they will be reviewed. Um, after approval of your proposals, you start developing the contracts, they are reviewed and you sign your contract if you are awarded and if your proposal was actually one of the winning proposals. So then you look at what are your responsibilities and what you're signing up for in terms of um, 
what your solution to the problem was. Ensure that you document, document, document. In project management, we always say whatever was not documented was not done. So if you have lessons learned, if you have success stories, if you have uh, m and plans that you develop, that your organization has, risk management plans, change management plans, all those things have to be documented. And they actually increase your chances as an organization to be able to win a proposal that you have submitted. So as you can see on the diagram there, we have positioning. Positioning is where we're talking about have you actually positioned yourself to understand or to know that there's a request for proposal coming? After identifying the, the request for proposal or knowing that there's a request for proposal coming, how do you position yourself? How do you process and develop your proposal? And then submitting, and then after submitting is the award phase. Uh, normally we use grant awarding phase uh, when now you actually sign the contracts for the obligations that you've been given for that proposal that you have actually won. So when we think about um, the request for proposals or the calls for proposals, we need to sit down and uh, actually understand what our client, our client here, the development partner really wants. So do you know what the client wants? Have you uh, had sessions to ideate have you thought about what you want to be writing? What is your organization's position as, as regards that request for proposals? Are you able to add value to um, the solution you're trying to offer to this development partner or the solution to the problem? What's your value addition as an organization? Have you read about um, the problem? Do you understand what the problem actually is? Do you have enough data to support your solution to the problem or to support your pro your proposal. And then also just trying to find out who are the other organizations that are uh, actually uh, bidding for the same proposal. Would you be able to know their capacity and how? what is your comparative advantage over those organizations? Are you able to know where they're implementing, how they're implementing, what is their strategy? You need to have all these things before you come down to actually writing your proposal. I had mentioned before that um, for the proposal writing and to be able to have a winning proposal, it is important for you to have a proposal development team where you have specialists from your team. You look at what are their capabilities, what are their um, expertise, and how do they come in to help to be able to write a winning proposal. Normally you have the program, uh, uh, people from the program, you have um, individuals from the finance team, you have individuals from the monitoring and evaluation team, you have individuals from your, um, if it is supply chain involved, for example, if it is a solution that is offering products, you need to have those people. So that then when you're writing a proposal, it is strong enough, you have expertise from finance to be able to help you with the budgeting ensuring that you have budgeted for all costs that are going to be incurred uh, during the implementation of that project. Secondly, the monitoring and evaluation team are able to help you come up with a monitoring and evaluation plan or structure or m and documents, tools and templates that are going to be used for monitoring and evaluation of your project. How do you propose to monitor your project? How do you propose to evaluate either mid-term, short-term, or long-term um, evaluations for your project? So all these people are important. You need to have clear functions. You need to have clear duties and roles uh, regarding the number of uh, individuals that you want in your team. But make sure you do not leave anyone out. Quality assurance. You need to have everyone represented in your team. You need to have a well-defined structure. Look at how, or rather what a well-defined structure means for you as an organization, looking at um, your members and their capabilities and their specialties. You need to have a strong team to be able to ensure that you can sit down and have your meetings, ensure that you're conceptualizing your proposal, 
in a way that um, works around your schedules, make your meetings, understand what the development partner requires and be able to come up with a concept note or a proposal that actually mirrors what the request for proposal is in terms of solutions you're offering. So when we're writing proposals, we usually have the technical part of the proposals where you're doing your conceptual framework. So the conceptual framework is actually a visual representation of your technical approach, and it shows the scope of work, what you're going to do, where, how, and stuff like that. It informs and guides your um, whoever is receiving the response for request for proposal on what your technical approach is. So that's why we are saying that when you're doing your you're writing your proposals, you need to have um, a team member who is the technical person, who is a technical advisor, understands the technical approach or the technicalities of whatever sector it is. If it is education, if it is health, you need to have that. Identify and formulate. Um, you have identified the problem. What is the solution to the problem, which is normally the opportunity. Uh, formulate your objectives, goals and objectives. We say the goals and objectives have to be smart, specific, measurable, achievable or attainable, realistic or relevant, and then time bound. Ensure all your goals and objectives are around uh, being smart. What are the activities that you are going to implement and what are the results? So the technical approach includes all that and you need to ensure that you have smart solutions or smart uh, goals and objectives to be able to achieve your solutions. And then finally, what is the outcome and what is the impact of what you're trying to achieve? I think we have spoken about identifying the problem. Uh, we have spoken about the statistics, the data that you need to use. Um, we have already spoken about the solution in terms of what the goals and objectives are supposed to be. So who is your target group? Who is the beneficiary? How will it be implemented? What is the timeline? Where? Who will manage the process? How will the process be managed? How are we going to ensure sustainability? What if the donor leaves or the pull out in between your uh, implementation? How are you going to handle that? So your objectives have to be smart, just as I have mentioned. Specific is what exactly, what solution are you offering? What exactly is the project going to provide? Measurable means how are we going to measure impact or how are we going to measure outcomes? How are we going to measure outputs? What are the performance, uh, key performance indicators for your project? Is your project achievable? Is it attainable? Is it realistic? Is it relevant to the problem and the need that we are talking about? So in terms of the results, are the results going to bring change or actually sort out the problem that we are talking about? If it's HIV prevention, are the solutions that you're offering realistic enough to be able to reduce the number of new infections for HIV. And then all projects are time bound. So what timelines are we looking at? Are we looking at a five year project, 10 year project? What are we looking at? We have already handled the technical approach. Ensure that you tell um, or you include in your proposals what exactly you will do, how you will do it. Um, ensure that you have put in your scope of work, demonstrate your ability and value proposition for the approach that you are going to give, ensure you show sustainability, and then describe your activities. These uh, results, activities, and all that should be clearly stated in your monitoring and evaluation plan, where you put in the work plan, the logical framework, as we are going to see. So when we talk about the logical framework, um, it is a document that actually uh, helps us to be able to show or to guide us in terms of crafting our, in terms of actually crafting our, um, our project. It gives a logical linkage to how the, how us as an organization are going to be implementing the solution to the problem that we have. Uh, 
we are we are proposing to solve. So when you look at the logic model, the logic model usually shows a connection between the inputs, the outputs, uh, inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impact, and how they link back into each other. And the logic model also helps us as an MND tool to be able to answer the question of why we are doing what we are doing. Um, what are the assumptions that we have made in terms of uh, our implementation or in terms of our solution to the problem? And it also helps us during the project to remain focused to what we uh, proposed to do. It helps us to be able to monitor and evaluate our, our implementation. And so when we're writing the proposal, we need to be very keen to be able to look at the logical framework understand our assumptions and show how um, one thing leads to another and if it actually makes sense and if it is going back to uh, what our goal was and how the impact will be. In terms of budgets, you need to ensure that uh, you have prepared a cost proposal and here you give an indicator of what the cost, the actual cost or an estimation of the cost of what you're project or solution to the problem will be. So you need to understand all your project requirements. Once you have understood all the project requirements, be able to give cost estimations for your project. No proposal will win without an actual budget. And the actual budget sometimes, um, or rather always has direct costs. Direct costs are the costs that will be used to directly implement the activities for the solution we are proposing. And then indirect costs are those costs that are either for the level of effort for HR in terms of human resource, the people that you're going to use, um, and then uh, admin costs and stuff like that. So you need to understand what are actually the budget requirements from your development partner. Sometimes they usually propose a percentage to go to the direct costs, percentage to go to indirect costs and a percentage to do to go to the contingency or miscellaneous costs. That's why you need to ensure that you have a finance person in your team to be able to do the financial budgeting for you. Finally, uh, we will look at how we do donor mapping, why we do donor mapping, why we need to map donors, um, how we do our donor research and prioritization, and then just action planning on how you reach out to, to the donors that you have already mapped in your organization. So why do we do donor mapping and what is donor mapping? Donor mapping is, that, is the actual research to be able to identify potential donors. Um, donors can be development partners, they can be uh, funding partners, they can be um, individual donors. So we have to look at what are the potential donors in terms of what problem we're talking about and what solution we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are proposing. So donor mapping actually helps us to be able to prioritize our donors and how we want to engage our donors. It gives us an understanding of existing and future funding opportunities that are aligned to our priorities. Remember me talking about um, doing your due diligence as an organization to be able to see what are the opportunities that are aligning to our priorities to be able to be funded either in future or currently. Are we able to have some intelligence on the ground to find out there is a development partner who's coming up with a request for proposal and it will be shared very soon or they'll send it out very soon. A donor mapping can help us to be able to diversify our funding streams, and this helps us when we're writing our winning proposals to be able to talk about sustainability. What if this donor pulls out? How are we going to sustain or continue with implementing our project? A lot of the times we also do donor mapping for relationship building and networking. How do we broaden our donor base, which also helps us in terms of our sustainability as an organization, and also just to be able to make decisions on where to invest our time, where to invest our money, and where to invest our resources. So for us to be able to map donors, one, you need to understand your own 
organizational priorities? What is your mission? What is your vision? What are your, what is important for you? What is your area of implementation? Is it health? Is it education? Is it leadership? You need to understand what your priorities are. And if it is health, is it child health? Is it um, maternal child health? Is it adolescents? Is it girls? Is it boys? You need to understand what your priorities are. What are the parameters you're looking at? What is the criteria and eligibility metrics for your donors? We don't just pick donors here and there. We have to align to, the donors have to align to our priorities and we align to their priorities as the organization of the priority. Uh, ensure you come up with an interactive tool in your organization where you can collect data about your donors and information about your prospective donors. There are tools that are available everywhere on the internet or you can develop yours to be able to come up with a tool that can help you collect data and information about your prospective donors. Research your donors, conduct proper research about your donors. And when we say conduct proper research, we will not be going um, specifically as an organization that is doing uh, child implementation or child uh, projects. You will not want to, or you would not want to uh, send proposals for organ to organizations that are involved in child labor. So you need to understand what your organizations are doing, where they get their funding from, who they get their funding from so that also you protect yourself as an organization from dealing with unscrupulous uh, donors. Ensure that you summarize and prioritize the opportunities that have been identified in your research. And by this, I mean in the interactive tool where you're collecting data and information, you need to be able to understand um, specific donor priorities and if those priorities actually align with your priorities at that moment. They could be aligning with your priorities, but in future, but look at, you need to summarize, is this a donor that I need to speak to now or later? Is, it, is this a donor that has uh, opportunities for me at this point or later? So the things that you need to consider in terms of criteria and matrices are key thematic focus areas and activities, geographical focus, if you need to expand or if the donor is expanding or not, because sometimes requests for proposals come for development partners who are trying to expand into other regions or other jurisdictions, and you need to understand that. Do you have the capacity or not? As an organization, what are your short-term, medium-term, and long-term funding targets? What are you looking at? Are you looking at unrestricted funding or restricted funding? Is your donor uh, able to give restricted or unrestricted funding? And we all understand, I hope we understand that um, the requirements for unrestricted and unres unrestricted funding are actually different, dependent on all development partners. Is it a new innovation that you're trying to explore? That the, does this donor or can this donor be able to fund a new innovation? What type of donors are you looking for? Who are your current donors? Would you want to go back to the same or get new ones? Um, what are the no-go areas or what are your funding policies? Just as I was talking about child labor, um, ensure that you know According to your funding policies, you know what are your requirements as an organization and what you can take and what you cannot take. Um, ensure that you know if the funding is coming from money laundering, what are the laws, what are the financial laws in your country. So you need to understand all those things. And these are some of the things that we look at when we're doing our donor research and prioritization. So while you're researching your donors and trying to uh, prioritize who is the donor to go to at the moment. You need to first look at your current existing donors, who are their partners, what is their network. Can we get other donors, can we get other um, new partners from their network? Discuss, have a relationship. When you, depending on the kind of relationship that you have built with your donor, then you're able to even have a conversation with them and look at um, who are their partners, who are their current partners, how do you network with them? 
research competitor funding sources and your peers. Look at other organizations who have a comparative advantage to you, who you can compare with, what is their value proposition, what is your value proposition. Um, do they have donors that you can reach out to as their partners? Do your due diligence. Look at your internal stakeholder network. Uh, find out, uh, can we get other partners from the, net, uh, from the internal stakeholders? Are they able to refer you to other uh, donors? Are they able to help you with your donor research and just doing your due diligence? Ensure you have a team that is doing your donor research and prioritization. Currently, we have common uh, portals and databases that are able to give us all this information that we're looking for. Uh, some of these portals are actually paid for. So look at which portal has enough information for you and a portal that you would want to invest your time, energy, and money so that you are able to get uh, a network of donors. Ensure that you prioritize uh, your donors as per the research that you have conducted vis-a-vis uh, -vis what your current and future priorities are. We normally say your perfect match will actually show a very high rating against all your criteria. So if they fit into all these parameters and criteria that we're talking about, then that's your perfect match. And you're able to actually interact with them to be able to respond to requests for proposals and uh, actually partner for implementation of your project or intervention in your area of um, implementation. This is a sample of a template of how you can um, do your donor prospecting after doing your research. Ensure you have your donor name, you have their website, you have a status of where your relationship is at. For example, if you have contacted them, you have applied, they rejected, do you need to put them as high priority or low priority? You need to understand that. Describe their area of focus. Remember, we're talking about the thematic areas. So those are their priorities. Where do they implement geographical area? Is there an opportunity for you um, to be able to implement with them or work with them or not? Uh, what is the priority? Is it high, medium, or low? Who is the directly responsible individual? This is important for accountability purposes to be able to know who to go to. The tool I was talking about can be interactive and live for everyone to be updating, but you need to have that one person who goes back to this tool and ensures accountability. What are the next steps in terms of a donor that you have researched properly and prioritized as high priority? What next? Do we send out a proposal? Do we call them to our events? So you need to have the next steps there. Give it a timeline and then contacts. The contacts is who is it you're contacting in the uh, organization that you have identified. The next thing after doing your research, mapping out your donors, and while mapping, you have those that you have given high priority. And those are the ones that you need to reach out to next. So the next thing that you're supposed to do is Find out if they're called for proposals or requests for proposals. Uh, get your team to be able to, or set up a team to be able to draft the proposals or the concept notes. Ensure you set up networking meetings. You can have thematic discussions. Invite the partners to your program events just to be able to ensure that um, you have created enough awareness to those partners about yourselves as an organization. Um, ensure that you send out organization introductory emails with your organization information. And just as I said before, ensure you assign responsibilities with timelines for uh, what you're going to do for your plan. Who is responsible? What is the timeline? And what are they going to do? And if it is proposals, ensure you have enough time to be able to ideate and design your proposal. Finally, ensure everything is simple, precise, and concise. Even when you're researching, ensure you're very keen, precisely. What do you want? Invest your time and resources. As I was talking about the donor databases, look at which database is important for you and aligns to your priorities. Use practical and accessible tools that you can use to be able to 
uh, key in your data about the donors that you need. Ensure you have your alerts and reminders. Sometimes we have a list of donors and we have forgotten that we needed to send out an organizational introductory email. So who is the person directly responsible? Can they be able to set up alerts and reminders? Ensure you have a process that has direct responsibilities for the teams to be able to update. And finally, for donor research and prioritization, network, network, network. Build the relationships. The relationships are important. The relationships actually uh, bring forth partnerships for implementation. Thank you very much. I will handle questions now. Sheila, you can guide me if there's any. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Linda. That has been that has been really interesting, and I'm happy that we're getting very good comments of how they have really learned a lot, and it has been quite a very interesting webinar. I'm seeing time has so much gone, so I will just ask maybe at least three questions, and then the ones that we've shared on chat, and then I'll give at least three participants to also ask their own questions as you continue. Maybe you can also help me as we move. Uh, which is better to map donor? Which is which is better to map donor before writing proposal or after writing a proposal? And maybe you can answer that with how is the proposal different from the concept note or the expression of interest? Then what are the main contents of a concept note? I'm sure that you'll not be able to cover much, but just highlight then. Abdullahi will join us in our proposal writing to get the very main essence of a concept. Yes, Linda. Okay. So the I think I've answered the question about when you do donor mapping. It is mm -hmm. it is important to do donor mapping before you write your proposals. However, mm -hmm. donor mapping is a process that is not, it doesn't have an end mm -hmm. because priorities can change and um implementation of, or, or rather solutions to problems. So we come up with mm -hmm. solutions to problems consistently. So mm -hmm. you can't say we are done with the donor mapping exercise. It is a continuous exercise. Okay. Uh, okay. Sometimes okay. Thank you. we as uh, partners do not do donor mapping and go straight into proposal writing. That mm -hmm. is fine. But for you to be able to actually get the correct donors, it is better to mm -hmm. do donor mapping before and then make it a continuous exercise. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Linda. So Innocent is giving a comment. Recently, most of don most donors discourage contingency budget. So maybe you can just give a tip, but he believes a lot of donors nowadays discourage contingency budget. And then um, Edna is saying, is it possible to prepare and submit proposals to donors when call for proposal is not released? Say there is a need at the community and the organization is looking for donor support. Yes, it is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to be able to, you're, you can uh, submit proposals to donors before they call for proposals. Those are the ones I was calling unsolicited um, funding proposals. So there's mm -hmm. no proposal, but you have mm -hmm. seen a need and you have a donor who can be able to support, so you can send. You can send okay. it out. Okay, okay. Okay. The other Thank question you. was uh -huh. about, you were talking about, sorry, the first question before this one. It was, asked, just, it was just a comment, like how donors nowadays uh, discourage. discourage, yes. Yes, yes. it yes. is because of misappropriation of funds. But uh, for donors who still give contingency funding, they usually give a very small percentage uh -huh. of your budget to be uh -huh. uh, for contingency. And that contingency budget can be able to support if you run into a financial risk, for example, mm -hmm. like put in your risk analysis or risk management plan. Or it can okay. even handle the inflation um, mm -hmm. that's going around, that's global at the moment. Uh, okay, okay, makes sense. Uh, so another one, I'll try and combine these two questions. I have seen many approaches to writing proposal based on different donor requirements. So is there any based approach that we can select among them? And uh, also, are there specific structures that you use for conceptual frameworks for RFPs? Someone had mentioned RFPs is request for proposals, right? And can mm -hmm. the concept frameworks be diagrammatic as well? 
yes, the, uh, the concept remarks can be diagrammatic when you're doing con uh, concept notes. Concept notes are usually very short um, documentation or rather very short proposals. They can be one pager, so you can use diagrammatic representations. Um, specific okay, structures okay, okay. always depend on your donor. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. you fidelity or you stick to your donor requirements for um, the approach to writing your proposal. Uh -huh. Normally there's okay. a general approach and sometimes you see um, approaches mirror each other. So it depends uh -huh. on your a lot and what approach they'd like to choose. Okay, okay, thank you for that. So I think I'll give a chance to the attendees to be able to uh, ask their questions. And uh, as they prepare, I think I'm seeing, we can give a chance to Shadra. Hi, Shadra. You can ask your question. Hello, Shadra. Uh, yes, I'm getting you. Thank you so much uh, uh, for this wonderful presentation. We have learned a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, it is just uh, appreciations. I don't have much uh, questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. Most of the things that I would wish to ask have already mm -hmm. been asked by my colleagues in the, in the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. so I thank you so much, and I look forward to always uh, uh, mm -hmm. learning more and more from you. Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Work. Thank you, Shadrach, for that compliment. Again, not only just questions, we also love compliments, suggestions, and anything that we can try to improve. Uh, let's have Leila Paul. Leila Paul. Leila Paul. Hi, Leila, you can unmute and ask your Hi. question. Hello. Hey, thank you so much. I'm so glad and I'm mm -hmm. enlightened by the session that we've had today. Mm -hmm. uh, that at this time, when uh, the presenter was talking about a uh, roadmap for winning proposals and there was an abbreviation, if that can be said in full so that we would understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also at the same time, just um, to request, because sometimes these uh, recordings don't come as promised, if mm -hmm. uh, in the future the presentation would mm -hmm. uh, the slides would go uh, slightly uh, slower, so that we can. Okay. Follow. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. I think uh, we will. We will. I like that. We will try and make sure that you get the recordings and the presentations on time, and maybe try to slow the pace uh, in terms of that. Thank you, uh, Linda. You can tell us about the abbreviations. Uh, which abbreviation specifically? There is one I've answered on the chat. DRI uh -huh. is a directly responsible individual. Ah, good. Any directly other? responsible individual. She Lila, a... you have a specific one that you want uh, clarification on? Yes. When that slide that uh, contains shortcut for winning proposals, there was before oh, shortcuts. RFP. Or oh, shortcuts for winning proposals before RFP. Let me just check. Yes. That. Yes. You said on the slides for um, roadmap to winning proposal. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, just a moment. RFP is request for proposal. Uh -huh. Before RFP, that's request for proposal. Uh -huh. mm, I see most of them have RFP. Yeah, RFP was the one that was there as a short form. So RFP is request for proposal. Sometimes it is CFP call for proposal. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I think I'll give a chance one more. Ebele. Ebele Omutubula. You can ask your question. Ebele. Thank you, Shola. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much mm -hmm. Linda, for the presentation. Um, okay. I just want to quickly find out is there any major difference between conceptual framework and logical framework? Is there any major difference? Yeah, between conceptual framework and logical framework, or they are basically the same thing. Yes, Linda. What's the difference? 
Okay, the conceptual framework most of the time um, identi or rather shows uh, specifically the scope of work, exactly what mm -hmm. you're going to do, what are your goals and objectives, what are you proposing. Then mm -hmm. when we go into the logical framework, then we look deep into now the goals and objectives. What are the specific inputs that we need? Uh, what are the specific activities that we're going to implement under those objectives? Do we have sub-activities and what are their linkages? So the logic model actually shows you from your goals and objectives, from mm -hmm. uh, your inputs into the specific mm -hmm. activities that are your goals and objectives, and mm -hmm. what they lead to in terms of the outputs, the outcomes, and the impact. So the logic model is where you plan out uh, your your specific implementation of uh, the project, and it gives you a graphical view of how you're going to implement your project and what your results are going to be. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Let's have Abrao Mushivi. Yeah, I just wanted to appreciate the presentation mm -hmm. and also um, the participation of all. Mm -hmm. uh, my contribution is on uh, contingency funds. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends uh, on the on the donor. Yes. For instance, we have some donors who just put it uh, as uh, reserve funds. Mm -hmm. uh, they allocate a percentage, and uh, this mm -hmm. fund is only utilized uh, when you request it for specific um, use. Mm -hmm. Then they have to use it. Because okay. uh, the term contingency funds always, as the presenter said, sometimes it was quoted as, as if it is the way of diverting funds. So mm -hmm. yeah, some donors have opted to put it as reserve funds. Okay, okay. That is, that is good. Thank you for that. Thank you for that comment. I believe you're all learning uh, out of it. Thank you. Uh, Victor? Victor? Victor, are you able to speak? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, yes thank you very much for the presentation. It has been mm -hmm. a nice one, and uh, there is some water we we can actually pick from the, the from the pot. Um, I am just uh, calling uh, maybe to inquire what do we need to put much on the program statement. What is ne needed? Then the other one is about. Uh, 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 some donors prefer using the templates and other donors, I think you can just make a write-up and send to them. Uh, which one is the best uh, to be uh, given to a potential donor? The third one is about uh, uh, most organizations, they deal with the livelihood and more so on a Greek. Uh, do we have uh, the specific a linkage to potential donors who can support uh, livelihood or a Greek. We are just calling from Uganda. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Victor. Linda, you've had the question. I didn't get the first two properly, but the third one, yes, mm -hmm. depending on, um, you can look at who are your existing um, agricultural livelihood uh, development partners at the moment look at their mm -hmm. network and be able also online you can specifically search for agricultural or livelihood um, development partners you will mm -hmm. get you will actually get databases for those kind of partners but the best place to start is who are your current donors or who are your current development partners and what or rather who are in their networks then you're able to get the uh, the the other uh, donors that you can actually reach out to. Um, secondly, you are asking something about which, what is better. Please repeat the second question. Hello. My, yes. my first question was uh, about the problem statement. Mm -hmm. What do we need to detail in the problem statement? In summary, then two, it is about networking with potential uh, donors who are supporting a Greek or livelihood. Uh, maybe you have a link as being a person 
who is well exposed and have some network, maybe you can give us a link to maybe potential donors. We can actually make a write up on proposals. So um, unfortunately, I don't have a specific link for only specific agri and livelihood uh, potential donors. You can look at your current donors in their network to be able to get that. Um, the problem mm -hmm. statement in a proposal normally is a, a summary of what is the issue you're talking about or what is the challenge, what is the gap, and then what is the solution to the problem that you have. Um, stated in that case. So it's very short, sometimes it's one paragraph to be able just to specify uh, or explain what the issue is, what the challenge is, and what is the solution, what's the solution you're offering for that problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I think uh, adding to that, I think it will be good if we all attend the upcoming proposal writing class first to be able to network and also two, to be able to get some of these sample proposals, because in that session, when we'll be in class, we will be sharing different aspects of how to write a proposal. We have various proposals and depending on what you want. And also for Friday's suggestion, we'll also have a chance to now know how do you write a proposal from an individual point of view as compared to an institution. And also any more information that you feel would really help you. So please kindly, reach out to us to be able to join this class so that you can gain a lot of resources and a lot of information on how to really work on these aspects of proposal writing. With that, uh, time has so much gone. I would request that um, for all the information and for all the questions that we've not been able to answer, please reach out on our on our platform that is Discord and you will get to meet Linda there as well. And she'll be able to answer some of these questions that you have been able to raise and any more that you really want, especially if you are embarking on that exercise of proposal writing. With that, allow me to end there and I wish you all the best and looking forward to seeing you in our proposal writing class. Thank, Thank you so you much. Everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Attention humanitarian and development professionals. Are you looking to take your career to the next level? Then you've come to the right place. Humanitarian Global offers self-paced online courses designed specifically for you. With our comprehensive curriculum, you'll build your capacity in the most critical areas of humanitarian and development work. Our course offerings include monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning, water, sanitation and hygiene, disaster risk reduction and management, food security and nutrition in emergencies, procurement and supply chain management, human nutrition and dietetics, maternal, infant and young child nutrition. With Humanitarian Global, you'll have the opportunity to grow your skills and impact the lives of people in need. Visit our website to learn more about our courses and apply today.